I'm gonna tell you something really important, so listen up. If you can't tell the difference between good and bad information, you're completely defenseless against the information war we're experiencing in the digital media age. Every single person with an agenda is competing over control of your mind and your decisions. If you don't believe me, here's a list of stupid trends that people fell for by trusting the wrong person too easily. That is exactly why I'm going to share how you can evaluate any piece of advice, research, or expert opinion using the same evidence-based framework that researchers use, but we'll break it down so you can actually use it in real life. And trust me, once you know the difference between solid evidence and complete bullshit, you're never going to fall for any of this crap ever again. So let's break down the five levels of evidence, starting with the lowest, which is tier D, all the way up to tier S. And I'm going to tell you right now that most of the evidence out there is tier D. In fact, you can even consider it tier S because it just downright sucks. Remember that list I shared with you about popular trends that went viral? The Chase Infinite Money Glitch trend started when TikTok users discovered they could deposit fake or fraudulent checks at Chase ATMs and then immediately withdraw that money before the checks had time to clear. These self-proclaimed financial experts posted videos showing stacks of cash, claiming they found a secret loophole in the banking system. They confidently explained the method to their followers, with some even charging people for this insider knowledge. The trend exploded because people trusted these online experts and rushed to chase ATMs across the country. There were videos showing people celebrating with a big smile, a handful of cash, and a void in their head. But uh, guess what? There was no glitch. Banks have always allowed limited access to deposited funds before checks clear. Your identity is linked to your account. So ultimately what happened was a few days passed, checks bounced, people's accounts went massively negative, Chase began freezing accounts, demanding payment, and suing their customers. Many participants face charges for check fraud, which, by the way, can carry penalties of up to 30 years in prison. This perfectly illustrates the issue of expert opinion as evidence. Expert opinion means trusting someone's advice because they seem knowledgeable instead of because it's been systematically tested. These TikTok experts seem confident and convincing, but their advice was based on incomplete understanding, no systematic testing, and uh, zero consideration of long-term consequences. This is why expert opinions tier D, because it can be dangerously unreliable when it's not backed by rigorous study and peer review. This is a scary situation to end up in, but there are four higher levels of evidence that could have saved these people a lawsuit. So level up from expert opinion, you've got case studies. This is when someone says, I helped 10 clients do X and eight of them succeeded. Sounds better than just an opinion, right? But here's what you got to know about case studies. They're cherry picked. Nobody's showing you the 50 people who failed. They're showing you their highlight reel. Think about the viral TikToks where someone interviews some random American about basic geography or history. They'll show you 10 people who can't find Canada on a map, making it seem like 99% of Americans are stupid, but uh, they're not showing you the 100 people that they interviewed who did get it correct, right? Because those don't go viral. Case studies are slightly better than expert opinions because at least they're documenting real events, but there's still unreliable evidence because you're only seeing selected examples not the complete picture. But what if I told you there's something even better than cherry-picked success stories? Now we're at tier B and finally getting somewhere. Observational studies track what happens to people over time without interfering. Think about the famous Framingham Heart Study, which started in 1948 with over 5,000 people, and now they're tracking those people's grandchildren. This is where we learned that smoking causes heart disease, high cholesterol is dangerous, and exercise actually protects you. Before Framingham, doctors had no clue about heart disease prevention. This beats case studies because you're getting real data from thousands of people over decades, not cherry-picked stories. You can spot actual patterns across different groups. But observational studies do have a fatal flaw. They can't prove cause and effect. 
Framingham showed smokers get more heart disease, but smokers also drink more coffee, exercise less, and eat differently. Is it the smoking or something else? Observational studies can't separate those factors. They show you everything mixed together, but there is something that can, so stick around and find out. Here's where things get interesting. Controlled experiments are when researchers actually test something systematically. They take two similar groups, change one variable, and see what happens. Let me show you exactly how this works with a story that saved literally millions of lives. A good example is James Lind's 1747 scurvy experiment. Lind was a Scottish physician aboard the HMS Salisbury on a 10-week naval voyage. During this period, sailors on long voyages kept dying from a mysterious disease called scurvy, which caused bleeding gums, rotting teeth, and weakness. Nobody understood what caused it. So what Lynn did was take 12 sailors with scurvy and divide them into six pairs and give each of these pairs different treatments. Everything else was the same. The pair who got citrus fruits were the only ones who were cured. Lynn proved that citrus cures scurvy by controlling every other variable. Controlled experiments are a huge step up because they can actually prove cause and effect, unlike observational studies that just show associations. Controlled experiments eliminate all the confounding variables. When Lynn gave citrus to only one group and kept everything else the same, he proved citrus cures scurvy, no guesswork. But controlled experiments aren't perfect. They're expensive, they take forever to run, and sometimes they're impossible to do ethically. You can't force 20 people to smoke for 20 years just to prove smoking causes cancer. That's just wrong. And because everything else is so controlled, the results might not work in the real world where things are messier. Plus, even a perfectly designed experiment is still just one study. What if the researchers made a mistake? What if it was a fluke? That's why controlled experiments are tier A and not tier S. You need something that combines multiple perfect studies together. I've got a question for you. How can we know for certain if a video game makes people violent? And we're finally at tier S. Systematic reviews and meta-analyses. I know that sounds super academic, but I'll explain it in a way that even the people who fell victim to the infinite cash scam can understand. This is when researchers look at all the studies on a topic, throw out the trash ones, like the small studies with no control groups or very obvious flaws, and analyze what the good evidence actually says. When violent video games became a thing, there was a whole controversy about how they make kids violent. In fact, still a controversy today within certain groups of people. There were individual studies done on this topic and they were all over the place. Some said that these games cause violence. Others said there was no effect, just total confusion. Then researchers did systematic reviews. They took dozens of high quality studies from around the world and combined them. What they found was that if violent games make people more aggressive at all, the effect is tiny like barely measurable tiny. However, some systematic reviews actually disagreed with each other. Now, you might be thinking, how could this be the gold standard if they disagree? How do you even know what is true at that point? Well, here's what you gotta understand. Some systematic reviews disagree, and that is kind of the whole point. What that is telling us is that the effect is either super small or doesn't exist. But how could it not exist if some studies are finding there is a correlation with violence? What this usually means is that there is likely another variable at play that is not linked to video games. That is why the effect is still considered small or non-existent. And you can see exactly why they disagreed. Maybe one review looked only at kids under 12, while another looked at teenagers. Maybe one counted yelling at the screen as aggression, and another only counted actual physical fights. When you can see these differences, you can decide which review makes more sense to you. This is why systematic reviews are tier S. They take the best controlled experiments, combine them properly, and give you the most reliable answer you can get. Not perfect, but the best you can get. Now you're probably wondering why this isn't considered perfect, and that is because they're only as good as the studies they combine. If all of the original studies were done on kids under 12, 
They can't tell you about the effects on teenagers or college students. This is the evidence you want to look for. When someone says research shows, ask, is this one study or a review that combined dozens of studies? Big difference. So now you're probably thinking, this framework is cool, but how do I actually use this in real life? Stick around because I'm about to show you exactly how to apply this in regular conversations when you only have 30 seconds to figure out if someone's claim is complete bullshit. I call this the FAST method, four questions that take 30 seconds but could save you years of bad decisions. Find the source. Who's telling you this? A real expert or just some random person online? Ask about the data. Is this just one person's story or did lots of people actually test this? Scope check. Are we talking about three people or thousands of people? Test method. Do they compare it to something else to see what actually works better? And look, I'm not saying ignore all advice that isn't tier S evidence. It can still be good information. Just keep it in the back of your head, but don't make that information your gospel without further review. If this is too much work for you, stick around because I'm gonna share some websites that automatically identify if something is legit or garbage without you having to go through a bunch of studies yourself. I'm sure you clicked on this video because you're probably tired of being confused by conflicting information. You're sick of not knowing who to trust or what actually works. Well, congrats because you took a huge step forward today. You can now confidently say you're not just gonna be a victim to the next chase money glitch scam or fall for the next pyramid scheme because you can apply these evidence-based strategies into every aspect of your life. If you're interested to see this framework in action, watch this video next on study techniques for beginners with no motivation. I use the same evidence-based approach to find what actually works. Not motivational fluff, but tier A and tier S research on techniques that work even when you don't feel like studying. Because your time is valuable and you deserve strategies that work. Also, use these websites to identify bad information. When you upgrade how you evaluate information, you upgrade every decision you make. And better decisions means you build a better life. So remember, think better, live better.